understand that? Purging and preserving the church from the corruption coming from the world. In the way it's saying, the world is trying to get into the church. The activities of the world, the pollution of the world, the corruption of the world, the lifestyle of the world is trying to get into the church. The implication of that is the world is controlled by the God of this world. The world is controlled by Satan. If the world gets into the church, then through that, Satan will have a way in the church. Satan will not have a way in our church in Jesus' name. And Satan will not erode into your life. And Satan will not get into your family the corruption and the pollution and the practices of the world coming through Satan will not have a place in our church in Jesus' name. But as we study, we need to find out, we need to examine, and we need to look at everywhere critically so that if any pollution is there, if any corruption is there, if the stain of the world, if the defilement of the world is entering into any life, into your life, or into the life of any member of the church, all of us will rally around and gather together by the grace of God, and we'll make sure that the church is clean, the church is cleansed, the church is purified, the church is purged, and this church and the people of God everywhere will be getting ready for the coming of the Lord in Jesus' name. I was waiting for a good, good amen. Purging and preserving the church from the world's corruption. Three things we're looking at as we look at the whole chapter. Number one, preserving Christ-like living in his glorious church. Understand, whatever verse we read and whatever <coughs> explanation we give, it is so that the church will be Christ-like and everyone will be living that glorious life, that Christ-like life in the church, which is supposed to be glorious. Number two, purging out contagious leaven from a godly church. The word contagious is very important. It spreads like anything. It, when you allow a little crack, a little defilement, a little corruption, and then it begins to spread, it destroys the whole system and destroys the whole church. That's why you want to purge out contagious leaven from a godly church. Number three, put it away. Corruptive Libertines, the people who take a law into their hand and the people who feel they are at liberty to do anything, they are at liberty to poison themselves, they are at liberty to defile themselves, they are at liberty to defile even the whole church, they are at liberty to break down and to hack down and to destroy the church that Christ paid for with his own blood. They are liberties and therefore because they are corruptive libertines, we want to really punch them out and put them away so we can have a truly gospel church. The Lord will give us the commitment and the courage to do it in Jesus' name. Let's come to point number one now. Point number one, preserving Christ-like living in his glorious church. Preserving. You cannot preserve what you don't have. The beginning then is to make sure that you have salvation. Because how do you preserve salvation when you don't have the salvation? And the next thing is to have sanctification. That you go on your knees, you consecrate yourself to the Lord, you're purified from the heart so that our self is gone, our sin is gone, the Adamic nature is dealt with, and the old man is dealt with, and Christ sits on the, on the throne of your heart. As a result of that, the salvation, you're preserving that salvation, the sanctification, you are preserving that sanctification, some doctrine from seeing how you ought to live, a wife or the husband, the husband or the wife, the parents or the children, the life we ought to live in the family, in a place of work and in the local church and we are carrying that salvation everywhere and we apply the word of God to our lives so that that salvation will remain intact. That's when you have something you know, to preserve. And so if you're still a sinner, the Lord is telling you, come to the Lord and to repent of your sin, be born again. It's after that new birth, you have an experience, then you have something precious to preserve. Preserving Christ-like living, that means the might of Christ is there, the word of Christ is there, and the goodness of Christ is there, and the character of Christ is there. If any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. It is when that new life is there. You have something to preserve. If you don't have the new life, if you don't have the grace that comes with salvation, if you don't have the righteousness that comes with salvation, there's nothing to preserve. But you are saved 
you're a new creature, you have righteousness in Christ, and you have the grace of God, then you have something to preserve. And it is that preservation in your life that makes you to preserve your position in the church, your place in the church. If you're not preserving salvation, you cannot preserve your membership in the church, or preserve your position in the church, or preserve your partnership with the people of God. So understand, the preservation we're talking about is that you preserve something spiritual in your life, and then we can preserve the whole church. Point number one, preserving Christ-like living in his glorious church. There are three things we're looking at here. Number one is the report. Number two, the responsibility. Number three, the receive. Number one, the report of grievous sinning in a gifted church. Number two, the responsibility of a glorious uh, servant in God's church. The servant of God, the pastor in the church, the local leader in the church has responsibility. And if you cannot carry out the responsibility, there's no point saying that I'm a pastor, I'm a leader, I'm a preacher, I'm this, I'm a servant of God. The servant of God is known not by the title. The servant of God is known not by the position. He is known by the responsibility he carries out. Point number three, the reason for guided separation in a gracious, in a gracious church. How will you and why will you take a rotten egg out and throw that rotten egg out? There's a reason for that, to preserve the whole basket of eggs to remain clean and to remain fresh so that that rotten egg will not destroy, will not defile, will not make a, an inedible the, on the rest of the eggs that are in the basket. And so when you put away that ungodly person and the unrepentant person, the one who remains rigid in evil and rigid in defilement. There's a reason for that guided separation in a gracious church. Number one now is the report of grievous sinning in a gifted church. Let's come to First Corinthians chapter 5 from verse 1. It says, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. Understand? Fornication is not the only sin that people commit that can take them to hell. Fornication is not the only sin that anybody who is a sinner needs to repent of. Fornication is not the only sin that makes people backslide. He could have said, it's reported commonly among you, the stealing among you. It is reported commonly that there is violence or fighting among you. He could have said, it is reported commonly that there is uh, fraud or fraudulence or whatever in your midst among you. And so whatever the sin may be, whether it's fornication or whether it's the love of the world or whether it is giving in to violence or whether it is fighting or whether it is divorce and separation scattering the families, whatever it is, the people of the world will be gossiping. They'll be taking the rumors all about ah, the church. They say this their name, and they say they're a gracious church. They say they're a godly church. They say they're a gifted church. They say they're a speaking in tongues church, and they say they're a miracle-working church, and they say that they are, they are people that have faith and they can move mountain. It's a mountain-moving church, but it is reported commonly among them in the world that there's fornication, there's defilement, there is stealing, there is sin of all types, and there is disobedience, and there is a disunity among them. And then it says, and such fornication as is not once named among the Gentiles. It was telling them the report we're getting about the church at Corinth, and the report we're getting may be about your own local church, in your district, in your group, in your state, in your region, is that the character of the people there they even go beyond the sinfulness of the people of the world. Remember once again, it's not only fornication that is called sin, all kinds of sin. There are some people that the fraud in their midst is greater, is higher than the fraud even in the world. The corruption in their midst is greater and higher and deeper than the corruption in the world. And then the violence in them or the politics, dirty politics in their midst is greater than the dirty politics in the world. Whatever it is, whether it is fornication or it is corruption or it is defilement, whatever the sin may be, we should not allow any sin in our midst. Look at verse 2. It says in verse 2, and ye are puffed up. What does that mean? They were puffed up because we have the gifts of the Spirit. They were puffed up because we're speaking in tongues. They were puffed up because miracles are happening. They were puffed up because all these uh, other things, uh, you know, we have a large congregation who are puffed up. They have good music. They were puffed up because 
because we have good administration. They were not looking at what they ought to look at. Because of that, they were proud. They were proud of the things that will not matter in eternity. Ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that has done this deed might be taken away from among you. Why should they mourn? Uh, let's look at First Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 9. Are you seeing why they should have been mourned? It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, it says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? What's your joy? You're speaking in tongues, but you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And you have a large church, and you have a, large, a great position, an important position in that church, in that big church, but you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God, and you have, you have been prospered. You know, I prayed, and God gave me a job, and he gave me money, and I have this, and I have that. I have a good uh, wife, I have a good husband. We have children. Our children are, are graduating. They have this and that. And we're put up because of that. Don't you know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators nor idolaters. And so, Paul the Apostle wanted them to understand. He wants us to understand. It's not only fornication. If it were only fornication, he would have said, neither fornicators will inherit the kingdom of God. But now, he begins to tell them, and he's telling us as well, neither fornicators nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. That means homosexuals, man and man, uh, living together as if they were husband and wife, or woman and woman living together as if they were husband and wife. He says, abusers of themselves with mankind. When you misuse your body, you abuse your body. And when you go into that kind of carnal relationship, sinful relationship, you will, if you die in that condition, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Never mind you're speaking in tongues. Never mind you have faith to remove mountains. Never mind that you have understanding of prophecy. Never mind you have the mysteries of the kingdom. But if you are like this, he tells us in verse 10, in verse 10, he tells us, he says, no thieves, the people who steal. You see, there are those who will say, you know, in our church, I've never been disciplined because I don't commit fornication. It's saying that fornication or adultery is the only sin that said that will take people to hell. But now Paul, the apostle says, no thieves, no covetous, no drunkards, the people who get drunk and they are into alcohol, into wine, no revilers. Look at that. The people that will revile, those that are good, the people who will revile, those who are holding on to sound doctrine, and every time they hear another somebody preaching sound doctrine, they say, what's that? They belittle those who preach the word of God, and those who stand for the truth of the word of God. He says, those revilers will not get to the kingdom of God, nor extortioners, the people who cheat and the people who oppress others, and they find a way of getting what belongs to others unto themselves. He says, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's why he was telling them that although you are gifted church. It tells, it tells us they are gifted church. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're reading from verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're reading from verse 7. It says so that he come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He come behind in no gift. And then there is a space there. The space there is for your righteousness. You are waiting. I have the gifts and then I have the gifts of the spirit. I have the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom. I have the sending of spirit and I have the gift of faith. I have the gift of working of miracles and the gift of healing and the prophecy and the tongues and interpretation. All that, that was their concern. You come behind in no gift. And then as a result of that, what I'm waiting for now, holiness or no holiness, sanctification or no sanctification, purity or no purity, we're waiting now for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Paul the Apostle had to say, but even though you have gifts, a gifted church, we're hearing reports about you. Let's come to number two here. In number two, the responsibility of a godly servant in God's church. Why does God put servants in the local church? After he has given us Christ, he has given us a Calvary. He has given us the doctrines. He has given us the Bible. And then we even have books. Why does he still to need to place a servant, a leader, a preacher, a pastor on the church of the living God? You know, there are people they don't understand that of the necessity of a pastor in a local church. I have the Bible. Yes, we know. 
I have the doctrine, yes we know. I have all the various things, and I have internet, I have radio, I have all those things. I can listen to, you know, the word of God. I have the CD there, I have the DVD there. But he has given us a servant. He knows you can have, he knows you can listen to a CD. He knows you can look at, you know, all the systems, social media. But social media is not going to direct you. It's not going to correct you. It's not going to discipline you. It's not going to question you, and it's not going to put you in place and make you stand. All those things, they're good, but God has given us a servant in the church, in the local church, and in the headquarters church. Not only a servant, a godly servant. What's the responsibility then of a godly servant in God's church? Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, we reading from verse 3. It says in verse 3, I, for I verily as absent in the body, but present in spirit. He was their father. When lunch already said, you might have 10,000 teachers, but you do not have many fathers because in the gospel, I have begotten you. I am your father in the Lord. And so now he said, I'm not always there physically, and yet I'm still your father. You might not see your father in the physical every time. He might not be at home every time. He goes to the place of work. He comes back. He travels, and he comes back, and therefore he is not present in body, but is present in spirit. His heart, if he's a real father, his heart is with the family. His mind is with the family. And he's following everything that is going on, even though he might be absent in body, is present in spirit. I'm judged already. I've evaluated already. I have weighed all the reports I'm hearing about you in the Corinthian church. I've judged already. I've examined it already. I've weighed all the pros and the cons already. I have examined your life and I've aligned it with the word of God, compared it to the word of God as though I were present. I were present with you concerning him that has done this deed. That means then a pastor, even after the church service, you are back at home. Your responsibility, you are thinking about the life of the members of the church. You are thinking about the reports you are hearing. You are concerned about every member getting ready and getting prepared for the coming of the Lord and therefore you are weighing their lifestyle and their actions and everything the reports you are hearing you are comparing that with the word of God so that when you want to come and preach the following week or the following uh, meeting it's not just you just read the Bible and just preach something that doesn't touch the lives of the people the way they are living I've judged already in verse 4 it tells us in verse 4 and it says in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ when ye are gathered together, look at this, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, when you come together, don't just carry on service as usual, meeting as usual, I'll be gathered there with you in spirit. And the Lord Jesus Christ will be gathered with you there, even though you cannot see him physically. You should imagine, you should visualize that Jesus Christ as the faithful one and the amen and the truth. He said, where two or three are gathered in my name there, I will be in the midst of them. Understand, he watches everything, he sees everything, he hears everything, he evaluates everything. You are gathered together, the Lord Jesus Christ is there and my spirit is there. You will imagine that, that your pastor is there. You will imagine that your father in the Lord is there because actually his spirit is there. Because actually his mind, his love, his affection, his attention is there. And so Paul the apostle said, I have a responsibility over the church at Corinth. Even though I'm not always there in the physical, yet I know I have a responsibility. And that's what he wants us to think about. He wants us to think about the life of the church. He wants us to think about the spirituality in the church. He wants us to think about the uncompromising stand of maintaining the standard in the church. We have a responsibility. It tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 2. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, reading there from verse 2, as it talks about the responsibility that the minister has, that the pastor has, I told you before, and foretell you as if I were present. He says, I'm telling you, like I told you before, he wasn't present there in the physical, but he says, as if I were 
Press say it. The same thing. You know, parents can tell their children, children, you go to school. I'm not there with you. My mind is with you. I'm praying for you every time. I'm thinking about you, and I want your life to shine forth and not to copy all the other children. Remember the home you are coming from, and remember the things we have learned, and remember the prayer, and remember the consecration, and remember everything we have put in place. My mind is there. And everywhere you go, walk, and live, and talk, and then interact as if I was present and the same thing here now a minister a pastor that has the a good of the membership in heart and that has uh, the progress of the membership at heart is living every time he might be in his house he might be studying he might be praying he might be doing whatever he knows that he has responsibility over the church of god and then he's talking to them he's writing to them he's sending to them as if i were present the second time i'm being absent now i write I'm being absent now, I correct. I'm being absent now, I counsel. I'm being absent now, I forge. I'm being absent now, I give directives, I give direction. Even though you are absent, even though you are not there physically, that doesn't mean I don't have any ministry now because I'm waiting till Sunday. I'm waiting till the meeting time. And when we get to the meeting time, I will do what I need to do. Being absent now, I write. Being absent now, I counsel. Being absent now, I correct. Being absent now, I still send the word unto you to prepare you for the coming of the Lord. And I write to them which are heretofore have sinned and to all other that if I come again, when I become physically present with you, I will not spare. I will not spare you. It tells us what the responsibility of a real pastor is, who is an overseer, who is having oversight, who is watching over the souls of the people because he knows he's going to give an account. Let's come to number three now. Number three, the reason for guided separation in a gracious church. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, now he gives a directive. He says to deliver such and one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Underline that, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Paul the Apostle was uh, teaching the Corinthian believers and he's teaching us, he wants us to understand that we are body, soul, and spirit. We are spirit, soul, and body. Most of the time, we are conscious of our body. If you, if you strike your hand or something, you feel the pain. That's your body. And if you uh, go into a place where there's smoke, you feel the watering in your eyes. That's your body. And if you step on a sharp stone, you feel the pain in your feet. That's your, that's your body. And if you take something that you shouldn't have taken and it doesn't go well with your body, you feel the pain inside your stomach. That's your body. Because of that, many people are not conscious of their soul. Many people are not conscious of their spirit. Spirit. You cannot contact God with your body. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You cannot, um, you know, see God with your physical eyes. That's your body. But it's the, your spirit, the inner man that sees God now. The body only carries your uh, spirit. Your, your body only carries your soul. And it's carrying your spirit and your soul until the day of death. When you die, the body will go to the grave, and then your soul and your spirit will go to God where it came from. And Paul the Apostle is saying, your spirit is very important, your inner man is very important, the other part of you that will go to heaven is very important, but you see your body that is uh, physical, that we can see, that's not as important. He said, now, look at it this way. The body, when the body feels pain, then your spirit will feel sorrowful. Your spirit will feel the suffering to help the better part of you, which is your soul, to help the better part of you, which is your spirit. Let's drive out that man, drive out that backslider, drive out a corrupter, so that the devil will punish his body. Then he will feel the pain in his body. Because he feels the pain in his body, that will then bring advantage and profit, repentance to the soul and to the spirit. So Paul the Apostle is not doing anything wicked. He's not praying for the death of the man. He's not praying that the man will be totally trampled up by the devil. But it is so that his soul will be saved, his spirit will be saved on the day of the Lord. Look at it right now so you can understand. To deliver such and one 
unto Satan. All the apostles is saying, I'm an apostle, I cannot come there as the apostle, and then I take a whip in my hand, and I say, I'm going to give you seven stroke of the cane. He cannot do that. He's not a village headmaster. He cannot, the local pastor and the other ministers there cannot say, this man, look at what he has done, and therefore we have the kangaroo court over here, and the kangaroo court says, he must be beaten, therefore, and you put his face to the wall, and then you beat him. He said, we cannot do that, for Satan can do that and give him a real smacking and give him real weeping that he will feel the pain for the destruction of the flesh and then he will wake up he'll say what have i done why did i do that look at the way i'm suffering now then he will go to god in prayer and he will repent and he will come to the lord you remember the prodigal son the prodigal son went to the far country and he was enjoying himself and he wasted all the substance with all that was there without us living he didn't feel anything he didn't feel any compulsion he didn't feel any conviction but the money finished, but there was no food, and the hunger, the hunger that was biting him in his stomach, that's his body, and when that hunger beat him in his body, then he woke up and said, why am I here, what am I doing here, I will go back to my father, and I will confess, and I will say, that's how the spirit eventually will be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus, I'm sure you remember Jonah, Jonah took the sheep and went the other direction that the Lord had told him. He didn't go to Nineveh. And then, eventually, you know the story, he was thrown into the sea. And when the whale then carried him to the depths of the sea, then all those seas, the weed and everything all around him, and then he suffered, and they couldn't breathe very well. Things were terrible. And then he said, Lord, I remember, please forgive me. Whatever you want me to do, I will do. That is the body being tormented and being oppressed by the devil by satan and then that led him to pray and the lord said to the to the whale to vomit him on the shore so the discipline the rebuke and the correction is to make the person suffer physically or suffer shame so that that will lead him to repentance and that will get him back to the lord when somebody is under discipline because he needs to recollect himself and he needs to check up his life and do the right thing if you're going to him and say don't mind everything is all right and you don't want him to feel any discomfort any shame any affliction any suffering you say we still have to keep fellowship with him but he's living in sin he will not feel the death of the corruption and the evil that he has done but when you're praying for him oh lord let this discipline turn him around let this chastisement turn him around let him feel the pain in the physical let him feel the pain of the lack of fellowship then when he feels that he will pray he will return back to the lord i pray god will help us so that when people are in any particular situation we will not be the people that hinders their repentance and their reconciliation with god and their restoration in jesus name let me hear your good day. amen, amen. Point number two now is purging out contagious leaven from a godly church. Purging out the contagious leaven from a godly church. We're looking at First Corinthians chapter 5 and we're reading from verse 6. Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lamb? It says a new Corinthian church, the way you glory, you still go about. Yes, we know about that fornication, but it's just one man out of many people. And we know about that fraud, but you know, it's just a one, a one businessman among many of our members. And we know about that drunk marriage, but what are we saying? It's just uh, one person out of thousands of people. Yes, we know about that covetousness and that lifestyle. Yes, we know about the worldliness in that person, in that family. But it's just uh, one person out of many people. That's why Paul the Apostle said, Corinthian Christians, Corinthian believers, your glory is not good. Don't you know that a little leaven, leaveness, the whole love. And then he says in verse 7, in verse 7 he says, Purge out therefore. That's what therefore means because of the danger of a little leaven and because of the corrupting uh, effect of a little leaven and because that little thing can spread and spread and spread. And
and corrupt everything everywhere because of that purge out the old leaven that she may be a new lamb a new creature that she may have a new life that she may have a new appearance that she may have a new manner of looking at things that she may be a new love as she are unleavened for even christ a passover is sacrificed for us in verse 8 it tells us in verse 8 therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth you'll see in what paul the apostle was a saying to the corinthian church he put great value on repentance before restoration you see there are times when somebody has committed sin and he has committed sin and therefore before the church even disciplined uh, that person he said i won't allow them to say i'm under discipline i won't allow that to happen and so he he goes out and as he goes out now although he, need, he, he committed sin although he did evil because he's out now he becomes a hero and people are asking him why do you live what's happened uh, why are you not here and then he says well i want to be there if uh, you know they will accept me i want to be there if this and that and everybody is saying they're pleading please come please come please come they make him to forget his past life they make him to forget the thing that he did that made him himself to run away and then when he coming back he's not coming back like a prodigal son like a prodigal daughter he's coming back like a hero and he's saying yes here i am now and nobody wants to talk about what happened about what he ought to repent of because everybody is saying come 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 and they do not understand coming to church does not get you to heaven and coming to be part of the fellowship does not get you to heaven in your heart in your mind in the depth of your heart you must remember your standing with God if you're not standing with God and people just make you a hero and then you come back and there's no repentance and there's no regeneration and there's no righteousness and there's no restitution you might be there and everybody say welcome welcome we so much appreciate you but you know in your heart that after you ran away all the things you did when you were away you even did worse things than the thing that made you to run away and there's no repentance about that without that repentance and you're not pushing out the old level you're not settling your life you're just saying i'm back i'm back that will not do that's why paul the apostle is saying says therefore let us keep the feast not with the old leaven neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness but with the living bread of sincerity and truth i pray god will give the whole church understanding in this matter in jesus name look at three things here number one preventing the polluting spread of a little leaven a little leaven that can corrupt everything and number two partaking of the passover sacrifice of our liberating land behold the lamb of god that taketh away the sin of the world is the one that liberates us and is a passover lamb i want to partake of him partake of his sacrifice partake of his salvation partake of his sanctification partake of his sufficiency and partake of everything he offers for us partaking of the passover sacrifice of our liberating lamb number three is preserving the, the pure standard of his lofty life preserving the pure standard of his lofty life look at number one here preventing the polluting spread of the little leaven now if you if you understand this take a little pebble in your hand and throw it to a river when you throw it to a river as it gets to that river you see the ripples going on spreading and spreading and widening and widening that's the effect of a little sin that is done and somebody has done a little what he calls a little sin is a mistake it's a fault and it's a, you know it's a pitfall it's my weakness or whatever it is that little sin is that like little pebble you throw in the sea and the ripples go on the same thing in the lives of many people a little leaven if you excuse that a little, a little leaven if you permit that a little leaven if you nurse that a little leaven if you protect that is going to happen affect many 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 other people it may even affect people that you don't know and people that do not know you you have done the evil you have dropped the defining thing there and other people feel that is a standard and that little thing goes on and on i pray that will not happen in our lives and look at this in galatians chapter 5 galatians chapter 5 we're looking at verse 7 in galatians chapter 5 verse 7 is still talking about that he said he did wrong well who did hinder you that you should not obey 
be the truth. He did run well in the past. You know, you, you avoided those little, little things, and you avoided the little leaven, and you avoided all those things that people excuse in other churches, in other denominations, to say, no, I will not do that. I commit myself, I consecrate myself to walking with the Lord, and whatever Christ will not do, I will not do. He did run well in the past now. Who has in that view that he should not obey the whole truth, and the full truth, and the entire truth, and the complete truth? Look at verse 8. In verse 8, it says, this persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. The people who are persuading you do that. Uh, you know, that's, that's not a uh, very serious. If it comes to the hearing of the leadership, trust us, will defend you. Trust us, will protect you. Will not allow the leadership to, you know, to touch you or to do anything. Those are people that encourage those little, little leaven and the people that encourage little misbehavior, little mis disobedience and little rebellion and they are promising the people that have the little leaven in their life, the little lost in their life and the little misbehavior in their lives and they are promising them not to worry, will defend you, will protect you and will, will twist the hand of the pastor of the, of the leader that he will distract his attention. He will not even be able to look at the little thing you are doing. That persuasion cometh not of him that called you. Then in verse 9, it says in verse 9, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. It will spoil the whole thing, the whole ministry, and the whole and the whole church. That's why it's telling us we need to prevent that polluting spread of the little leaven. Look at number two here. Number two is partaking of the Passover sacrifice of a light breaching lamb. It tells so also in First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that she may be a new lamb, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Let me remind you, in the Old Testament, that's in Exodus chapter 12, the children of Israel had been in captivity in the Egyptian bondage for hundreds of years. And now they were going to be delivered. And the Lord said, You'll take a lamb. And that lamb must be perfect and pure and spotless and then you will kill that lamb and you will apply the blood on the lintels of the houses where you are and when I see the blood tell me the rest I will pass over you but before that blood of the Passover lamb can be effective efficacious for you you will search your house if there is any leaven in any way, you will take all the leaven and you push them out of your houses. If any leaven is there, the blood will not avail for you. And that's the same thing Paul, the apostle, is telling us and telling the Corinthian believers, forge out therefore the old leaven. You see, there are people, they come to the Lord and they say, Lord, I believe you died for me. I believe you died on the cross of Calvary. I believe you provided salvation for me. They are not forging out the old leaven. They are backsliding, they are not correcting that. They are fornication, they are not repenting of that. They are adultery, they are not repenting of that. And all the stealing, they are not repenting of that. All their lies and deception, they are not repenting of that. They are just saying, Jesus, I praise you, Jesus, I honor you. You are the exalted Savior, and you are the Redeemer, and your blood will cleanse me. Everything will be all right. I know Jesus, I believe in you. You are going to take me to heaven. Forge out first. Forge out as the priority. Forge out, therefore, the old leaven. You cannot keep the leaven there. You cannot keep the morality there. You cannot keep the compromise there. And you cannot keep all those forbidding objects there and say, I just want Christ, the Passover lamb, that is sacrificed for me to avail for me. Forge out, therefore, the old leaven, that she may be a new lamb, as ye are unleavened. And then when there's no leaven there anymore, no corruption there anymore, no defilement there anymore, and no guilt there anymore that you are covering something you are hiding something you are concealing something you know? and when somebody comes to your house and comes to your apartment you carefully and you cleverly cover up something so that they will not see and they say brother brother sister sister and when your phone you keep your phone very well and you put a pin number there so that your wife will not see the picture that is inside there so that your husband cannot see all the pornography that is inside there you cover up all that pornography and you cover up all that and I said, Jesus, my Savior, Jesus, my sanctifier.
liar. It's all lie. It's no, that's not going to get you to heaven. Put out, therefore, the old leaven, that she may be a new love, as she are unleavened. For even Christ, after punching out the old leaven, Christ has passed over his sacrifice for us. And let's come now to uh, number three. Number three here is preserving the pure standard of his lofty life. If Christ has died for us, and Christ has shown us the perfect example, how we ought to live at the lofty standard, the high standard of the gospel we ought to maintain. He's telling us, after you have put out the old leaven, you're not going back to that thing again, and you're not searching for the thing again. Now I've got salvation, now I've got sanctification, now I've got restoration. Now the discipline has been lifted. I'm now part of the people of God, and they have embraced me, they have accepted me. After they have accepted you, you must make sure that you preserve the pure standard of his lofty life. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 8, it tells us, Therefore, let us keep the peace, not with the old leaven, the old thing that we did that made us to be cast out, the old thing that we did that made us to be separated from the people of God, the old thing that we did that made us to backslide, now that we have come back to the Lord. Keep away from that old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. When I was under discipline, that one did not uh, did not visit me. When I was under discipline, that person did not uh, you know get in touch with me. And now I come back. As I come back now, I look at all those people, and that one I will not greet. That one, that one I will not fellowship for. That one, that one I will not do this. You are not restored yet. You only thought you are restored because you are in a position and you are in a place. Your heart is still not right. If you are really restored, there will be no malice there. If you are really restored, there will be no wickedness. Now. And now that I come back, I'm going to show them all those people that think they're in authority and they think they can discipline somebody, I will show them perfect. You're still a sinner. You're still a backslider. When you're fully restored and you are cleansed and your life is turned around and changed, malice will not be there. Vengeance will not be there. Revenge will not be there. Any bad character, any bad attitude will not be there. You'll not be campaigning among the people of God saying, are you for me or you're for them? Are you for me or you're for the pastor? Are you for me or you're for this person? You will not be like that. All wickedness is gone. It says, boss, let us keep the feast with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, of sincerity and truth. Your life will be transparent and your life will be holy. You'll be above reproach. Now you are living carefully and you're living courageously and you're living uncompromisingly on the standard of the word of God. It tells us in First Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 22. First Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 22. It says, seeing ye have purified your souls, it's you that will do it. A personal discipline, you cannot do that for you. We cannot save you. We can just correct you. We can counsel you. And we can say, because this is not right, step aside and correct this and correct that. That's all we can do. But you are the one that will go back to Calvary. You are the one that will take the efficacy and the effectiveness of the blood of Jesus and be totally clear. Seen, ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfaith love, of pretending love, transparent love, wholehearted love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Your love is not lost. Your love is not tending towards fornication or immorality. Your love is now coming from a pure heart and you do that fervently. In verse 23, it says in verse 23, being born again, born again. Now that you know the leaven is gone, the defilement is gone, all the pollution is gone, all the corruption is gone and the blood of Jesus has washed you and cleansed you and purified you. You are born again. The Spirit of God is bearing witness. You are now a child of God. The leaven that was there before is no more there. There is a cleansing in there. And you are clear. You are clear. And there is nothing between you and God that hinders your fellowship with God. You say, Father. Then the Father answers, my son, my daughter. The road is totally clear between you. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. I pray that this kind of experience will be in every one of us and for every one of us in Jesus name let the church say amen, amen. point number three now in point number three putting away corruptive libertines from 
Truly gospel churches. Put Tina away. You see, if we have the privilege of bringing in, we also have to have the power and the possibility of pushing out. There are people, they only know how to bring in, they don't know how to send out. It's like you have a family. And then you have a children. Anytime you go to work, uh, those little children, you cannot send them to kin the kindergarten yet. And so you need somebody to take care of them. And that's, that's right. That's okay. And then you go to the village. When you get to the village, you say you're looking for somebody. You've not been in the village for a long time. And somebody having familiar spirit, somebody having mommy spirit, somebody having this or that. And the villagers don't think anything serious about that. But you say this one is a hardworking lady. This one is a hardworking girl. And, uh, you know, we'll take care of your children and you bring that lady and then you teach the lady how what not to wear how to tie scarf and all that but all the tie scarf will not remove the familiar spirit and now you brought her in to your family and now you hand over your children to go to that hey lady you go to work and when you go to work that lady has her own agenda she wants to win them for her master the devil and so she'll be teaching them do you like to fly without aeroplane? Do you like to go to some meetings where you will eat and everything will be wonderful? And the children, they don't know nothing because this is now they call her sister, they call her auntie, they call her whatever name they call her. And then she begins to pass something across to them. And when you come back home, when you wake up in the morning, your little girl says, Mama, something happened in the night. We are flying. And we were flying to that place and to that place. And we were there. We ate, you know, a kind of a rice and never eating before we ate it was sweet tonight we're going again how did you go to such a place what happened is uh, you know so and so they point to the person you brought in and then you say you need that you are praying you are praying you are praying you don't know how to cast out you don't know how to push out you don't know how to send away that person there are people that know how to bring in they don't know how to cast out if you're a pastor if you're a preacher and you're a leader you must know the people that are corrupting the church the people that are polluting the church and the people that are bringing in evil into the church and you need to to know how to put away the corruptive liberties from truly gospel churches. Look at three things here. Number one is the command to separate from the pollution of contaminants. And number two is the commitment to submit to the precepts of Christ. And number three, the concern of saints for the purity of his church. Let's look at number one. Number one is the command to separate from the pollution of contaminants. Look at First Corinthians chapter 5. We're reading from verse 9. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Don't company with them. Don't befriend them. Don't interact with them. Don't allow their character, their evil, their loss to spill on, on you. And then in verse 10, in verse 10, it says, Yet not altogether, but the fornicators of this world. What it means is, don't resign from your place of work because uh, co workers are fornicators. Don't uh, resign from, don't uh, leave school because some of those students say, your class, they are fornicators. That's what it means there. It says, yet not altogether were the fornicators of this world or were the covetous or extortioner or the idolaters but then must seek needs and go out of the world. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, but now I have written unto you, not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother, be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such and one known not to eat. You cut off relationship, you cut off intimacy, you cut off association from such a person that will pollute you. Now, let us uh, understand that you are a father in the family. And you say, I'm a child of God, I'm an adult, I'm matured, no, the character of no one on earth, nobody can influence me to do evil. You have a wife, and you have tender children. And this person you are befriending, he comes to the house. As he comes to the house, his, his language is terrible. It's the pollution coming out of his mouth is terrible. The language coming out of his mouth is terrible. The jokes and the gesture and the things he says and the illustrations he gives, you say, I know, but you know, I'm an adult, he cannot influence me, but he will influence your children. 
but it will influence your family, but it will spoil your Christian faith and your Christian testimony. That's why you must be vigilant and you must understand that you have the commandment to separate from the pollution of contaminants and you'll not allow them to contaminate your family and then the same thing in the church. Somebody says, you know, I'm a pastor and even though I have all those ministers and they get near me, no problem. I've been preaching now for 10 years or for 20 years and no matter what they say and no matter their lives, we are just for fellowship. They cannot influence me but they can influence your congregation. The congregation will say, if a pastor who knows the right thing and the word of God and sound doctrine, if he's in fellowship with this person and would even hand over his pulpit to that person, then we're going to follow and then you destroy the church. You were commanded to separate from anything that will pollute the church of God or your family or our lifestyle and God will give us the grace and the strength to be obedient to that commandment in Jesus name. Did I hear an amen from deeper life? Let's look at number two now. Number two is the commitment to submit to the precept of Christ. The commitment to submit to the precept of Christ. And then let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We're reading from verse 12. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? We cannot go out and judge the people on the street. We cannot go out and judge the people and correct the people. I cannot leave this uh, pulpit now and then go to another denomination, another church. Even if they invite me to preach there, even if I agree to go and preach there, I cannot say, okay, after my preaching now, you, uh, you are not an uh, usher anymore. You, you are not a singer anymore. I see this, I see it. I cannot do that because they are not within my authority, under my authority. That's what it means. What have I to do to judge them that are outside? Do not ye judge them that are within. You cannot control another person's wife, another person's children, another person's family, but your own family. If things are not going right, you have the right, you have the responsibility, you have the commandment that you correct members of your own family. And thank God those of us who are here, father and children, is the family of God. If I see anything that will hinder you from getting to heaven, because I want you to get to heaven, and you must get to heaven. I will say, my son, we cannot do this because this will hinder you from getting to heaven. My daughter, you cannot do that. This will hinder you from getting to heaven. And because you know I say that in love, and I say that wanting the very best for you, you will say, yes, I understand. Then you get on your knees and you correct all those things. And by the grace of God, with counsel, with correction, with response, and with uh, proper responsibility, and we're relating together as teacher and student, we're relating together as father and children, we're relating together as a pilot and passenger to get us and drive us all to heaven by the grace of God on the final day we'll make it together in Jesus name. As I get into the kingdom, I look to my right, I look to my left, I look around, I say praise the Lord, you are there. Where are you? I say praise the Lord, you are there. You'll be there in Jesus name. That's a commitment, a commitment to submit to the precept of Christ that says, here is what you do, we judge what is inside, we correct what is inside, we put right what is wrong. Look at number three here. Number three is the concern of saints for the purity of his church. The concern of saints for the purity of his church. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're looking at verse 2, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. This is the goal, this is the dream, and this is the expectation that the whole church will be the sanctified church in Christ Jesus, called to be saved with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Remember, that's a calling. Remember, that's a consecration. Remember, that is a commitment that the church of God, with all its membership, will be saints, called to be saints and sanctified. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 3, in Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 3, it tells us about what the church should be said, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let each 
not the ones named among you. As become a sage, temptation might come. Then you remember, I'm a child of God. I'm a sage of God. I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. I'm the bride of Christ waiting for the time of the rapture. And when the Lord will come any time, morning, noon, or night, I will be ready. Fornication must not be once named in your life. Ugliness must not be once named in your life. Pornography must not be once named in your life. And anything that is evil, anything that is unrighteous, anything that is polluting, anything that is corrupt, you know, must not be once named among you. As you have given your life to the Lord and the blood of Jesus has placed you and the blood of Jesus has washed you whiter than snow and you want to continue in that relationship with the Lord, in that fellowship with the Lord, and you want to be ready by the time the Lord will come. You want to make sure that any form of sin, any shape of sin, any size of sin, fornication, any form of un ungodliness, any form of uncleanness or covetousness must not be once named among you as a becoming sins. Look at verse 25. In verse 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. The Lord loves us. And because he wants us to be ready for the rapture, he wants us to be gracious, he wants us to have the fullness of the grace of God, he wants us to be glorious, he wants us to have the glory of what he has purchased and the life that he laid for us as a perfect example. And he wants us to be ready for the coming of the Lord. He says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. He let heaven to come to the earth. He let the glory of heaven to come to all the, all the shame and all the suffering and all the crucifixion and all the betrayal that he experienced in this life. He gave himself. He gave himself so you can be saved. He gave himself so you can be sanctified. He gave himself so that you can be purged and you can be presented in the sight of the Lord without blemish and without any evil. And then he tells us in verse 26, the reason why he gave himself that he might sanctify, that he might purify, that he might purge, that he might cleanse, that the blood of Jesus might take away every Every stain and every spot and every defilement and every corruption and every leaven that might wash everything away, cleanse everything away, that he might sanctify and cleanse it of the washing of water by the word. What's the purpose for that? Look at verse 27. In verse 27, that he might present it to himself. What kind of church? I said, what kind of church? Every local church should be a glorious church and then our church all together should be a glorious church and you must be a glorious Christian when you have a glorious brother there a glorious sister there, a glorious brother there, a glorious boy there, a glorious daughter there and when all the members of the church in your heart glorious, in your mind glorious, in your Christian experience glorious, in your appreciation of the word of God glorious and in your demonstration, the life you live glorious, when every believer, when every Christian, when every member of the church has that glorious life from the heart to the inner man to the spirit to the soul to your thinking and to your action and to your behavior everything that you do when that glory of god is reflected because of the cleansing of the blood of the lamb that's when the whole church will be glorious that's why jesus gave himself that's why he gave that sacrifice that will be saved that will be sanctified that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or ring or any such thing for that it should be holy you'll be holy all of us will be holy in jesus name that's a sanctification experience he wants to present to himself when he comes back when he comes for the church and the dead in christ will rise and then we which are alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds he wants us to be holy and without blemish and i pray the lord will do it in your life in my life in all our lives in jesus name we're reading from we're reading from hebrews chapter 12 and i'm reading from verse 14. hebrews chapter 12 we're looking at verse 14. it says for no peace with all men with how many people how many people are you going to be fighting with i said how many people will you fight with nobody because you are going to be at peace with all men at peace with your wife at peace with your husband at peace with your neighbors at peace everywhere you go follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the lord he wants us sanctified he wants us purified and he wants us to be part of that glorious church that christ is coming for and it's only on that condition anyone will see the lord the position we hold in the church the authority we manifest in the church and the things we do in the church the activities all that will not prepare us 
us will not get us ready for the rapture if the level of uncleanness is there, if the level of fornication is there, if the level of corruption is there, if the level of uh, sinfulness is there, if the Adamic nature is there, if the fighting, the violence, and the dis discord and disunity, if it's there, all the position will not get us ready for the kingdom. It is the purity of heart and the purity of life and that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord that will get us there. That's why Jesus himself told us in Matthew chapter 5 verse 8, Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 8, it says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I pray you'll see God on the final day. I said you'll see God on the final day. Because you use having position in the church, and then on the final day, when the Lord comes, you are not able to see the Lord. What's the use? You have power, you have position, you have authority, and you have activity, you have whatever it is, and you have, you have amassed all the things of this world. And then when the Lord comes to take his people home to heaven, you are nowhere to be found. He will be of all men, of all women, of all churchgoers, the most miserable. But when you are saved, when you are sanctified, and when the Lord purifies your heart, and he gets you ready for the kingdom of God, and you have the blessing of the pure in heart and there you see the Lord on the final day then you'll be happy that you overcame all those temptations you'll be happy you overcame all the corruption you'll be happy you stood firm in the things of the Lord until the coming of the Lord I pray all the grace you need all the strength you need all the power you need to be ready for the coming of the Lord the Lord will put into your life in Jesus name let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer and say Lord I want to be ready Lord I want to be ready Lord, I want to be ready. If there's any leaven, purge it out. Any fornication there, purge it out. Any adultery there, purge it out. Any uncleanness there, purge it out. Any pornography there, purge it out. And any kind of a fraud there, purge it out. And make sure that your life is according to the word of God. Let the blood of Jesus cleanse you. Let the blood of Jesus purge you. You remember, you must take away the leaven before you can say, I trust in the Passover sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance first before restoration repentance first before regeneration repentance first before you can have the righteousness that prepares you for the coming of the Lord open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer let him do what needs to be done before you leave the church today Forging and preserving the church from the world's corruption. The word of God has dissected our heart this evening. We want to take whatever that may be pollution onto the Lord this evening. This is a surgery of the inner man the hidden man, the inner bedroom where visitors don't come to. This hour, let's purge ourselves of anything that will hinder you from making it on the last day. If you look at the history of the Corinthian church, it was a city in the land of Greece. And it was a bustling hub of commerce. And it's not just commerce, it's a worldwide commerce. It was the center of attraction for business. And it had a degraded culture and went into idolatrous religion. And this church was planted by Paul in his missionary journey. But because of the bustling nature of the Corinthian emplacement in Greece, people were coming from all over the world to do business, to do commerce. And this started affecting the church that Paul has planted. And there was a need for him to address some of the ongoings fornication among you. It is reported commonly that there is fornication reported common. It was common among you and such fornication as it's not so much as named even among the Gentiles. 
even among the sinners that one should have his father's wife. My brother, my sister, let's go to God in prayer. A little living, living at the old, um, purge out the old living so that we may enter into his grace, into his presence with a new living. The church needs to be preserved. You and me need to be preserved. Although we are in the world, we are not part of the world. We are part of a living, glorious church. There's need for purging. There's need for inner examination. My brother, my sister, this is the time we have. There is nothing like purgatory that we can cleanse ourselves hereafter. It is now that we can prepare to be part of that glorious church that is marching onward into his presence. How do we prepare? By putting away the corruptive tendencies, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, the, 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 the worldly comparison. I have a bigger car than you have. I have a bigger house than you have. I have a bigger title than you have. Those will not be found in heaven. God is not going to ask you. He's not going to ask me, are you a doctor? Are you a professor? Are you a millionaire? He's not going to ask you your property, how many you have everywhere. He's not going to ask you. It's only going to ask you for your soul. Will your soul meet with him? He has prepared a place for you and me. The Bible says, blessed are the pure in heart. It's only those that can see God. Are you pure in heart? There's an opportunity this evening to be purified. Of any Adamic nature, of any tendency to be like the world where we find ourselves. This is the time for self-examination follow peace with all men, and holiness, and holiness. Last Sunday, we saw holiness. We saw sub submission to the authority and the will of God. Without holiness, without holiness, we cannot have the peace of mind, the peace of God, without which no man, no woman, no rich, no poor, no doctor, no professor, no title, we see the Lord. Time for cleansing, time for purging, my brothers, my sister. The Lord is ready to cleanse you right now. His blood is made efficacious, available, and is commanding as you get purged for you to separate from the pollution of contaminants. What are those contaminants? Lost of the eye, pride of life, and evil concupiscence. Mention it. We're in a world, in a place like the current in the land of Greece, bustling with commerce, with dollars. It's time for us to have our consciences purged of evil work, purged of evil thought, purged of corruptive libertines. This is the time, my brother, this is the time, my sister. Tomorrow may be too late. You never know what can happen through the night. This is the time for us to prepare. The word of God has come to you to preserve the pure standard of his lofty life. He's lifted up above every other thing and he has gone and he has prepared a place for you and me that we will be with him there in paradise. What will take you away from his presence? Is it the money? Is it the fanfare? Is this the glory of this world that took Solomon away and he made many wives? I pray God will help you. God will help me. That no malice, no unforgiving spirit will make us miss heaven. A man of God, a minister, widely used, powerfully used by God, but is entering there is doubtful. Unforgiving spirit, my sister, towards your sister, my brother. This is the time for the surgical operation. It's reported, widely reported, not even as among the Gentiles. And you are peeved off. And have no rather man that he that had done this deed might be taken away from among us. Let's go to God in prayer. Ask him to do his operation this evening. Ask for mercy, ask for pardon, that he will prepare you. That after all this sacrifice, after all this toiling, you will not miss it, my brother. You will not. You will not. Remember Moses. He almost missed it. Let's pray that God will help you. God will help me that we keep toiling on. 
and nothing will make us to backslide. Our precious Father, Lord, we thank you for dissecting your word in our heart this evening. So searching. Lord, this is the time to prepare that Father will not miss heaven. There is nothing that will make us to miss heaven. We have come here just for the purpose, Lord Almighty, to have bread on the table, to put food on the table, that that bread will not take us away from your kingdom. Nothing on this earth, Lord, will take us away from your kingdom. Help us, Lord. Help us. Help us. It's only pure that will be with you in paradise, Lord. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers. Thank you for your servant you have used, Lord. We pray you keep him, Lord. You will pray that nothing will make him to miss heaven also. And all the souls he has won unto you, Lord, we shall all see him like he said, that you want to see us there on that day. Lord, I pray you will strengthen us. You will preserve us. You will purge us. And that, Father, you will forgive all our inadequacies, Lord. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers. For in Jesus' mighty name, we pray. We want to welcome those who may be fellowshipping with us for the first time in a Bible study for the first time. You want to signify by raising your hand or by unmuting and telling us your name. The Lord is happy you are here with us this evening. And you can see what the Lord is doing in our midst. And like Moses told his father-in-law, come with us, Jethro. Our Lord will do you good. And our God will surely do you good. Anyone like that? Any newcomer? They will come in Jesus' name. Our weekly activity remains the same. Just to remind us of our programs in the week. We just had our Bible study starting 6.20 every Monday. We also have a children program on Thursday and the, the youth follows thereafter by seven o'clock, the children by six o'clock. And on Friday, we have an enriching Friday revival and evangelism training service, whereby we seek the face of the Lord in prayer. And he's a Prayer answering God, he will meet us at our various points of needs as we come together by 6.20 on Fridays in Jesus' name. And on Sunday, we gather for a Sunday worship service, a time, you know, we appreciate the Lord in praises and in prayer and also in dissecting the word of God from his servant, our uh, our pastor, Pastor Charles Kudochi, or whoever their roles assigns to dissect the word of God for us every Sunday by nine o'clock and with a prayer service prayer of 30 minutes, 8.30. And as you come, the Lord will do you good in Jesus' name. Let's not forget that uh, next week Thursday is the beginning of our regional convention starting 17 Thursday next week or through to Sunday, the 20th. And I believe that we have made plans. We have booked, put our accommodation and also have registered online with the link provided in our WhatsApp handle. If you have not done so, you're almost running late and need to start making those bookings and those registration. God willing and God helping us, the train, be going to North Carolina, Kingston, come Thursday next week. And as we prepare physically, we also prepare spiritually. We say, Lord, pass me not by in this year's convention. That need, that burden at Calvary is lifted up. Come with it, and our Lord will do you good in Jesus' name. We want to take our offering, and if there are other announcements, uh, our uh, pastor will let us know through our WhatsApp handle. We want to take our offering. We know that the Lord has blessed us during the week. We want to raise our offerings up to him so that we commit it unto him and then bring it 
as you're coming to a church on Sunday, bring it with you, along with you. Our precious Father, Lord, we are most grateful. We are appreciative of your goodness and mercy upon our life. We thank you for all that you have blessed us with, and we give our token, we give our tithe and offering, we raise it up to you for the furtherance of your gospel. Pray that you receive it as you have blessed us, Lord. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers. For in Jesus' mighty name, we pray. So let's remember to come with the offering on Sunday. And also remember to reach out to those who have been invited for the convention. Let's begin to reach out unto them and to remind them and to also ensure that they have registered and they have also put in place plan for their accommodation. And as they come, the Lord will do them good in Jesus' name. We have come to the end of our Bible study this evening. We want to unmute and share our grace together. Let's unmute our grace together. One, two, go. May the grace, the grace of our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our God, and his sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit with us and forevermore. Amen. Lord, bless and mercy shall follow all the days of our life, which are well in the house of the Lord. Forever and ever. Amen. 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 Have a blessed night in Jesus' name. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hey everyone, get ready for an event that will transform your life. We are excited to announce the annual conference tag, This Same Jesus, happening from October 7th. The husband is the head of the wife, even us. Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, 
Therefore, as the church is submissive unto Christ, so let the wise be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their own wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, and of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause, for this reason, to this end, shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This it's a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church, nevertheless. Let every one of you, in particular, so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverends, respect, or honor her husband. As we look at the scriptures, we find that marriage is God's own institution. It is something that God himself originated. And it is something that God himself began. And he gave it to humanity. As far back as Genesis, immediately he created man. Genesis, I'm reading from chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, we're looking at verse 26. This talks generally about the creation of man. It's in chapter 2, you have in particular the coming of the woman and then the institution of marriage by God himself. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image after our own likeness that shows the original plan and purpose of God. He wanted man that will be like him spiritually, be like him also morally, so that the life will reflect the creator who has created us. So he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. It's not talking of, it's not a wanting to create a man that will be a puppet, a man that will be weak, a man with no spine, a man with no courage, a man with no life to live, but a man that has dominion over everything on earth. In verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Then it says male and female created he them. We have the details in chapter 2. And after the creation in chapter 2 of the man, here is what God said. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. A help suitable for him, a help appropriate for him, a help that will support him, a help that will sustain the purpose for which I created him. That's already telling you the plan of God concerning marriage. And it's telling you the purpose of God concerning marriage. And eventually God created him and brought Eve unto Adam. And then Adam recognized that this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. I am man 
and she will be called woman. And then God establishes, established at that time, a principle for the rest of the world in all the generations that will follow. Look at verse 24. Therefore, that means because of that, because of what God had done for Adam and for Eve, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. It's not talking about Adam. Adam had no father, had no mother. He's saying, because of what I have done for Adam and Eve, and I created them one after the other, and I brought them together. I originated the union. In all the marriages that will follow, he will originate the union. In your marriage, if you are not married yet, he will originate that union. And then in all the marriages that will follow, I'm going to take this person, Adam and Eve, as a pattern, as a model. Here is what I've done. He has the power to do it. He has not changed. He has not changed. He will do it in your life in Jesus' name. He says, therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. It says, you leave one relationship to come into a lasting relationship, and they shall be one flesh. You see, in that original plan of God, one man, one woman, that original plan says God does not want polygamy. And you see, there was nothing that Adam could do to divorce Eve and marry another. There's no other woman. God created only one. It shows the plan of God from the original creation and institution of marriage. Monogamy, one man, one woman. Not only that, created Eve to be different from Adam. A male and a female. Not a male and a male. A man and a woman. Not a man and a man. It shows the original intention of God. And it says, therefore, shall a man leave father and mother. It says, what I have done here now is a symbol, is a foundation, is a step, is a springboard to all the marriages that will follow after. One man, one wife. And then a man and a woman. And then there is no chance for divorce. In fact, the word of God tells us very clearly that God hates divorce or putting away. Malachi chapter 2. In Malachi chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 14. Because marriage today should still follow God's plan. And if the world has forgotten the standard of God, the plan of God, the purpose of God, the church must remember the plan of God and must follow after that plan of God. Things may change, but God never changes. Malachi chapter 2 verse 14. Yet ye say, wherefore, because the Lord has been witness between you, between thee, and the wife of the youth. The wife, singular, of the youth, your very first wife, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet she is thy companion. You have dealt treacherously. You have been unfaithful to her. You have driven her out. You have put her away. And yet in the mind of God, she is, even to this present time, thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. The Lord established marriage as a covenant. It's not just, you know, I'll be your friend, you'll be my friend. We'll live together, we'll plan together, we'll do things together. It's not something we do privately. A covenant is a public theme. There are people that are asking us, can we not just decide to take uh, the woman and then privately we, do, we agree together because um, it's an agreement between us and we can make it as private as we want to. No, you cannot because it's a covenant. 
And the covenant is not a secret thing. It's a covenant you make before God. And you make before the people of God. That's why it says, is the wife of thy covenant. Look at verse 15. And did he not, did not he make one? It's going back to Genesis. It's going back to the original plan. And it said, didn't she make one yet? It says that had he not, I see the residue of the spirit, and wherefore one. Why did he make one? The man and the woman. For them to come together as one. That he might seek a godly siege. Godly marriage, heavenly minded family, that she might seek. A godly seed, therefore take heed, therefore watch, therefore take caution, therefore beware, therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, says that he hateth, tell me, Put in a way, he hated divorce, he hated separation, he hated go your way, I go my way. You see, marriage is not just your private affair. Marriage is not ju just your private decision. God is involved in this. And because God is involved, eternity is involved. It's after all, marriage is an earthly thing. And whatever I do, that's just my personal choice. If I decide I don't want to continue, that's me. No, that's not just you. God is involved. And it says God hated putting away. And then it goes on to tell us what will happen? He says, for one covered violence with his garment, says the Lord of hosts. He's saying that there's so much violence in homes, so much um, wife beating, husband nagging at home. And God says, it's not just, just that you live together, he wants you to have peace.